Um, hi, I'm, I'm Thomas Smith, I'm the education chair at DMLA, and we're really excited to welcome you to the first webinar in what promises to be a really exciting series of webinars on legal topics. Um, we're planning to do one quarterly, and uh, these are featuring members of our legal committee who are all top lawyers and experts in their fields. Um, so today the topic is model releases. But again, we're planning to cover property releases and other types of releases, as well as editorial topics and other legal topics. So this is a big benefit of um, being a DMLA member. You can attend these for free. Um, if you're not a member already, we'd love to have you. And you can be here in the room where it happens and ask your, uh, your questions and make comments. Um, just also a reminder that our International Digital Media Licensing Conference is coming right up. It's October the 22nd to the 24th in San Francisco. Um, we have limited tickets because it's uh, our first in-person event since the pandemic. Promises to be really fantastic, but make sure to grab your ticket now if you want to attend, um, because again, space is limited for that. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand it over to uh, to our panelists to dive in to model releases. Hi, everyone, and um, welcome again to um, the DMLA webinar uh, on releases and when you need them for our first, which is on people and models. A um, few housekeeping matters. We would ask if everybody could keep their audio on mute. I think that right now, um, automatically, everybody's on mute. So if you could just keep it that way. And um, if you have any questions or comments, uh, please feel free to put that into the chat and we'll make sure we address them as much as we can. Um, also, very important, anything that is said here today, um, it is not to be construed as legal advice in any manner. Uh, we are not here giving you any kind of legal advice. It is just an educational webinar. So um, it's not a substitution for legal advice. Um, so now that that's done, uh, I would also like to um, introduce our panel today. Um, firstly, there's, well, me, <laughs> Arui Kashyap. Uh, I'm a partner at Kashyap Partners and Associates LLP. Uh, which is a law firm in India, California, and New York, and I specialize in transactional tech and media law. Next, we have Heather Cameron, who is the Director of Legal Risk Mitigation at Getty Images. With almost 25 years at Getty Images, Heather is an absolute pro at managing IP-related risks, rights, IP litigation, and indemnity, uh, indemnification strategies. She's tru she truly has some very, very interesting stories, and I can't wait to hear some. Next, we have Margaret Vincent, the interim, uh, interim CEO and VP Legal at Stocksy United. With a plethora of experience in almost 10 years at Stocksy, Margaret is a true genius at digital rights and one of the best in her field. She has had some very valuable insights into the industry, and I'm glad that we get to hear them today. Last, but definitely not the least, we have Nancy Wolf, partner at Cohen Debates, Abrams, and Shepard, LLP. She is at the top of her field in copyright, media, and art law with an immense love for the creative industry. Her primary focus is on the convergence of art and technology. With her diverse experience, she has some truly intriguing stories, which we are lucky enough to hear today. Now, without much further ado, I'll hand it over to Nancy, Heather, and Margaret to tell us some more about releases and when we need them. Trying really hard to advance my slide. I'm having like... <laughs> Okay, going back to 2020, technical problems. Okay, it is my understanding that there was a request from a member to really get into it about property releases. And we love that topic. We do. We love it. But we thought, oh my gosh, there's so much to talk about. And maybe setting up with talking about model releases and why we have those first kind of leads really directly into the whole property situation later. So we love your questions about property releases. We're not going to forget about them. We are not. We're going to make it its own thing, but we're making some building block foundational stuff. Nancy, you know all about this. You, um, This is uh, you know, your bread and butter and how we bonded 24 years ago over models and litigation and model releases, which kind of kicks us off to our very first topic, Nancy, talking about rights of privacy and publicity, complicated, you want to say a few words about yeah, what these me, rights are? Let me jump in. So uh, rights of privacy and publicity are known more as torts. So we have copyright that protects the, the ownership of content, but we also have rights to our own identity and likeness. And those are known as rights of privacy and rights of publicity. They are a little bit different, 
Um, it's a little confusing. I'll get into that. But these are state law rights. So unlike copyright law, that's a federal law, and it's more or less a similar regime across the country, um, the right of publicity really derives out of a tort, one of Prosser's four torts, if you want to go back to law school, anyone here, um, which is the right of privacy, which was the right to be left alone. And then there's all these other rights not to have like um, private affairs disclosed and um, and things like that. And one of those rights was not was sort of a right of appropriation, not to have your identity commercialized. And that's really grown into the right of publicity. So you'll hear right of privacy, right of publicity, sort of for our purposes doesn't matter because we're talking about why you need releases and it'll cover both. But uh, many states have statutes that govern um, when you need consent and permission and when you don't. And then there's still a whole bunch of states that still rely on what we know as common law, which is just based out of case law and historical uh, reasoning um, going back to all those Prosser torts. So even though the laws vary from state to state, we've come up and the industry does have just really one form of model release um, because the variations don't change the fact that you need permission in some instances and some in not. What may be different is something that you see up here, post-mortem rights. In some states, um, because right of privacy was a very personal right, it was about being left alone and having your uh, private affairs kept to yourself that you didn't disclose to others. Um, it was personal. When you died, those rights died. And so, for example, New York was always like that until very recently. Then there's other states um, like California and others where um, it's a property right and you can transfer your rights to your heirs upon death and it goes on. So variations in states mean that some states, um, the right is almost forever. Like, and it really depends what famous celebrity died in your state. So who's one of the most famous celebrities? You Elvis. probably see him still walking around, he's still in Vegas, Elvis. So in Elvis, it's like a trademark right. If it's commercialized, it can go on forever. Um, and uh, I think like Oklahoma, it's 100 years out of death. Uh, California is 70 years, which sort of matches the copyright law, which is life plus 70. New York uh, just very recently has a postmortem right of publicity that is, I believe, 40 years after death. And I have to put a plug in for DMLA because uh, the right of publicity requires you, and we'll get to in the next slide, to have permission for commercial uses. And there was this whole issue about whether licensing is a commercial use because money gets exchanged, which is a common misconception about what's a commercial end use and what isn't. But in New York, thanks to DMLA members, um, Getty and Shutterstock, we lobbied New York to make it absolutely 100% clear that the act of licensing would not be considered a commercial use. So we have our very, very own photo industry carve out that says nothing in this section shall apply to any person, which is any kind of entity that offers a service that displays, offers for sale a license, sells or license a work of art or other visual work or audio visual work to a user provided the terms of such sale or license do not authorize such user to engage in acts that constitute a violation of this section. So our industry standard license agreement protects all of us from, at least in New York, from having any right of publicity claim from just doing our business. So um, we can move on. Okay, so Nancy, we get yeah. this lot. Margaret, I know for a fact you get this lot. When do these rights matter? What's the context? There's slightly different rules to consider. It's an editorial type of end use versus a commercial type of use. Margaret and I are very familiar with the fact that customers love to work in the gray area. <laughs> and um, or, think, or think they're in the gray area. <laughs> think or, or think that they're slightly, but it but it looks so editorial in nature. It's not really a commercial use, is it? Even though it's a branded content moment. So I don't know if one of you kind of wants to go through just the basics about editorial versus commercial and maybe when to phone a friend. Like maybe you need a you know an expert um, to help you consider 
what kind of use that is. Um, I'll just jump in for one minute because there's probably something I didn't mention in the last slide. Um, the the most important thing about right of public publicity and privacy in the U.S. is that the U.S. has a First Amendment, and our First Amendment um, has two parts. It's freedom of expression, which would be things that are artistic, and freedom of the press. So when we talk about editorial use, that's a bucket where something is illustrating something newsworthy or a matter of general interest. Basically, if the public's interested in it, you can illustrate an image with an article. And it doesn't have to be precisely that person. There just has to be a reasonable connection between the person and the article. And that is an editorial use. And because of our First Amendment, that um, you would not need a release for things that are for news articles and broadcast and documentaries and textbooks, because you're illustrating something truthful, even if it's a sports game or a concert or something, an art exhibit or something interesting, it doesn't have to be hard news. Um, and commercial speech is not protected by the First Amendment to the same extent. So that's where the right of publicity cuts in. And the First Amendment has always sort of had to be balanced with people's commercial use. And so that's why we have two different buckets. Um, and the other thing to remember is that this is US law and a lot of other countries, and we'll get to that la later, have um, different rules where you can be um, a public figure, but doing something very private like grocery shopping with your family. And that could be considered a private act and you can't take pictures, but sort of in the US, if you are in a public place, essentially someone can take your picture, um, which is why we're the home of paparazzis. So <laughs> now I'll, I think, let, I think... I'll let Margaret fill in, but I realized yeah. I hadn't mentioned our very, very, very unique and important yeah. first amendment because most countries don't have that. Yeah, and that definitely is an important thing. And I think you did a great job even in there of sort of explaining the editorial and commercial distinctions. I think that Heather had it exactly where that gray area gets in and when um, clients are telling you that it's not commercial or whatever else. Um, but yeah, I think like advertorial is a great example of that. Um, I think like it could be, it looks like an article, a news article. <laughs> it reads like a news article, but if it's, you know, promoting a particular brand or something like that, that is that is still commercial. And uh, there's definitely, I think, for a lot of the things that we're talking about today and we'll be talking about releases, there's a fair amount of educating your clients that's inevitable um, because we are the experts on these things and not and not them. But um, yeah, I mean, certainly there's there's some that are really easy and then there are some that fall in the, in the middle and are a little bit harder. Um, Stocksy works all in commercial at the moment, so that makes it a little bit easier because we just handle everything at that level, um, you know. But I, but Heather, I know has uh, probably well, never... and customers keep dreaming up new ways to use content, which is awesome. This is a great problem to have. Um, but oftentimes they're looking to us to give them legal advice about what our end user license agreements say. Yeah. And I am not even a lawyer, so I can't give anybody legal advice anyway. I would just like, you know, phone a friend and I'd get my own legal advice you from Nancy. Yeah. But um, that's a, a pressure I feel like agencies sometimes feel from our customers. And you just have to sort of think it through if you're issuing you know custom licenses yourself if you're if you're not working in a marketplace like having your content distributed through getty images or stocksy or shutterstock you might have to think through some of the more complex ways that customers might want to use content and do a bespoke custom license for that client just to make sure i'm not sure what you're doing here but if if you're using my content with people and those people are not released and you're doing something of a commercial nature with it. I I want to make sure you're not coming back to me if those people have an issue with it. So it just kind of goes into the drafting of your license agreements. You know, this actually gets me into a really interesting question that um, recently I've been asked a lot by clients, which is if somebody makes a parody video of you using AI 
the buzzword these days. Um, but if someone uses makes a parody video of you using AI and they have not asked the personality that they're sort of trying to mimic, uh, do you need a release for that? So uh, open to all. Okay, so yeah. assuming this parody video is not selling a product or service, it's you're making a parody of someone sort of a public figure. Um, <clears throat> So parody is part of First Amendment free speech. So you can usually make a parody of, you know, a celebrity and, you know, use AI. I mean, there was some very funny thing where uh, it was called Ru Republicans, where, you know, many Republicans were changed into drag queens. <laughs> that went around as a meme for a long time or the Pope in a puff jacket. So, you know, because they're public figures, uh, you you wouldn't need a release for that and and you're probably you know not selling posters of them it was just you know a a, a meme going around um you you could if it went too far and people didn't realize it was a parody like you it looked too real um you could all, perhaps go into the world of defamation where you might be creating something false like if you made it appear like someone was in jail and they didn't couldn't tell it was a parody it looked too real and that's the one thing with ai is when hopefully someone's done in such an obvious way you realize it's not real but that's one of the things that will be be coming up in the, those areas but that's that's a really interesting um question and it, the other thing is you know nancy called out the, the the first amendment piece that's so specific for the united states and you know that's something to keep in mind too as you're if, if you're i had we had a situation where there was a it was an incredible parody about um giving guns to families it was very critical i mean it was sort of a, a whole like parody of gun culture and all these things but the content it was licensed content through us but um it, it, we ended up like our, our European contributors really did not understand the parody piece because it's not <laughs> The cultural issues were very unique to the states, as were the legal issues there. So um, it did involve sort of explaining and, and how that works and why it's parody. So just you know something to keep in mind when you're working with with a global um, contributor base and, and client base. Okay, I'm um, going to move us along here. Nancy, you specifically wanted to talk about this case and sort of oh, set this up before we actually sort of take a look at the actual model releases we use today yeah. and so, what to think about. Um, as I mentioned, there's two parts of the First Amendment, freedom of press, which is all the newsworthy exception, and freedom of expression, which, which is artistic expression. Um, and I don't know, probably in the uh, a year and a half ago with the NFT craze, I'm sure you couldn't go any go to any site without seeing what was probably a celebrity photo manipulated with some kind of design um, that was being sold <laughs> as an NFT. And I'm sure there weren't releases for any of those because they were probably, you know, borrowed from some stock sites where they have editorial pictures. Hmm. But anyway, um, I had a very interesting case in New York where the question of whether you needed releases to sell fine art prints of people really came up for the first time in New York. Um, New York had a right of publicity law that um, at the time is uh, was only for the living at the time and was limited to um, you only needed a writing if someone's likeness was used for purposes of advertising or trade. They didn't use the word commercial. And so this photographer named Arnie Svensson um, lived downtown New York and he inherited a um, a very long lens from a friend of his who was a birder. And in front of his building where he'd lived forever all the way downtown um, had been almost like a garage chop shop. And then this beautiful building emerged in front of him, which for every photographer's dream had these sectioned Mondrian windows. And he became fascinated that the only thing he ever knew about his neighbors were like these little glimpses you would get from behind the screen and the curtains. So he did an anonymous exhibit where he put together 
uh, a number of these, and they were actually quite beautiful and large. They were shown in Los Angeles, nothing, and it got shown in New York. And some journalists wanted to figure out what building it was and sort of outed him because they were all listed as neighbor one, neighbor two, neighbor three. No one was identified. So once he got outed, the neighbors knew, and there was one image that had a little girl upside down. Um, and the parents freaked out that their child was in uh, a photograph and wrote a demand letter saying, you know, you're violating New York law. And I wrote a very nice letter back saying, well, you know, photography is a form of expression. And when you live in New York and you people can see you from your windows, you're really your expectation of privacy is very different and these were not done for advertising and they were not done for trade. Well, that one picture of the little girl happened to be part of the invitation to the exhibit. So we said, as a courtesy, we will take these pictures out of the exhibit and did that. However, the newspapers had picked up um, and, and was commenting on the show and they had that invitation. So the invitation got published in the newspapers. The family didn't believe that the photographer didn't plant these in the newspapers and we even paid for them. And so they sued under and for an injunction under right of privacy, uh, under New York's right of privacy law at the time, went into court, walked into the courthouse and the clerk immediately looked at us because this case got in all the newspapers and they said, we've been waiting for you to come here. And the first thing that happened is the judge was like, everyone thinks because you sell something and these that it was a commercial use. And so I started out with someone thinking my client, you know, was a child molester um, to explaining and educating the court that no, really that, you know, look at these pictures, you know, the, the newspapers have made it very salacious, but you know, they're not salacious pictures. They actually look like beautiful paintings. And under New York law, there is nothing that controls how you take a picture, you just look at the end use. And these are, are works of art, even if they're photographs and if they're sold. And so this the the court agreed and the case was dismissed and then they appealed and I had to go to the first department and convict six judges who didn't like me and didn't like the fact that you could do this. But by the end of the argument back and forth, they said, so I guess the only thing you could do was change New York law. And I was like, yes. So it became very clear that uh, photography is an expressive work and you can sell photographs without releases, which has always been the case. My office is filled with portraits from photographers. I have a portrait of Picasso. I have an O'Keefe. I have a Kennedy. I have an Audrey Hepburn. I mean, it's, I mean, photographs have been sold since the beginning of time without releases, but this case sort of just brought it to light that um, photographs, just like a painting or a sculpture, are expressive work. So um, it's interesting. So, for example, California does have laws about how you take photos because there's so many paparazzi. So they have paparazzi laws that um, would prevent someone from having, you know, injuring someone in a high speed chase to try to get a picture or uh, using a drone or a long end, a long uh, range lens through maybe a peephole in a fence. But essentially, if you're walking in a public place or you can be seen in a public window, then um, you're fair game, which is, again, why we're home to the paparazzis. It's true. Um, also, Nancy, do you have the um, JFK by Arnold Newman in your office? Is that the one you have? Yes, I do. I have the same one. It's so good. Yeah. Um, also, just a note about kids, you know, celebrities and kids, there's a little bit different rules of the road, I think, in California uh, versus New York. But I can just tell you, as a, as a company that has a lot of editorial content of a lot of very famous people and their children, just like with stock photography, celebrity parents care a lot about how their children are depicted in the media. And you just need to be aware, know your audience. Yeah. And I think that's mostly because of the pressure and backlash. I don't think the law is that different. It's just, they have a very loud voice. And if you want to ever like take a portrait of them and you've done something bad, they may not let you. So I think it's just sort of a yeah 
sort of a between, you know, between the lines kind of sensitivity. Yep. All right. Well, let's talk about, oh, Margaret, sorry. In for this, that parents are a key part of model challenges. <laughs> I have just a follow-up question to that. Um, to, I mean, we just talked about public places and um, people and how they treat their kids, like how um, celebrities are sensitive about how their kids are portrayed. But a lot of this sort of revolves around recognition and, and whether you are or are not able to recognize the person in a public place or um, if like the camera is zooming on and you know that they're trying to depict that one person or that one part of that person's body that makes them recognizable. So what I would ask is, what what do you think makes someone recognizable? Is it just the face? Um, are there other things that are involved? Um, yeah. So what what makes someone recognizable? I love that you asked this because we're gonna we're gonna walk through what an actual model release looks like and what's like critically important from a legal defense standpoint, but also what Margaret and I would love for photographers to remember, like what's important and why. So hold that thought because we're definitely gonna get into the recognizability. But first let's go take a look at the model release, thinking about consent. This is a lot of language. And also I just want everybody to know, Nancy and I and Margaret are aware that over time model releases have evolved a lot. Some folks on this call might remember how a model release was on basically the equivalent of a prescription pad and it could fit in a photographer's back pocket. So if you were doing street photography, you could whip it out and have somebody sign a two sentence release. Things have changed and they've changed because uh, claims and litigation and informed consent. So Nancy, I don't know, do you wanna say um, just a, just a few words about your considerable experience in this area? Oh yes, informed consent is is um, a real issue, and it, particularly when you're dealing with with uh, stock photography, because that's really broad. And I think a lot of the public doesn't really understand that, uh, particularly if you're trying to do natural. And I I know Heather, we've had some issues where it, where you're doing photographers doing street photography because customers don't want everything to look so posed and they like the the natural look so photographers will set up you know street photography shots and ask people to sign releases well we've had releases that get signed by Bugs Bunny and Mickey Mouse and uh you know you don't even know who signed it um or they have no idea what stock photography is and they sign it and then they become famous and they don't they want to like obliterate any stock photography they ever signed. So they're like, I never really signed it. That's not my name, even though I have this very curly Q heart above my eye every time I sign it. Oh, it's uh, always, that's not my or, name. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> I, I thought you'd always let me know when something's going to be used or I get paid when I was going to get used it. So I think it's really important to be very clear um, when you're asking someone to sign a release, what it's really for. Um, there's electronic releases now, so you want to make sure it's really, they really read it. Um, and um, that, you know, they actually do know what they're signing. Uh, there's language now in, in our new release, you'll see here about biometric data. Um, that's new. It's not in many of the old releases because there is some uh, laws, particularly in states like Illinois, and it's coming to California and other areas um, where uh, companies, particularly using AI, can um, uh, use your data, which involves your identity and likeness and your you know, facial features for things like facial recognition. And uh, if you haven't given permission, there's there has been a lot of fines and a lot of problems um, with that. So we're sort of thinking toward the future and expanding um, what a release is. Um, and, you know, the most important thing is you don't want your customers to ever get a claim. And which is why uh, there's a broad release. Uh, we do say nothing pornographic or defamatory. Um, and that you won't bring a claim. Um, so there's a lot of good reasons to have these releases and I'll let ever people jump in. 
Yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think the other thing about the the biometric elements and all those updates, it really does also speak to um, the, the shift in, 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 in what we see both in laws and in, in practice. Um, law can be a little slow um, compared to tech advancements. And so this is just a, this is an update that helps cover all of those advancements as they're happening. Um, and just a really smart way to do it. I am in Illinois, which is one of the no biometric states, which is very interesting. There's all kinds of tools and things that aren't accessible um, to us that other people play with. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely um, worth noting. And uh, I will say that my favorite way to talk about um, stock and <laughs> releases with models is to reference the Friends episode of Joey uh, in the ad on the subway. It's one of those <laughs> cultural moments that it, it works less well as um, I get older, it just it turns out. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those good ways to sort of explain, you know, you don't control every possible use and, and help, to help people understand. Um, yeah. I also think there's a fear sometimes um, if you explain too much, they won't sign the release. I hear that from time to time. And while I totally understand it, I've been the photographer getting releases and it it does have that sort of element to it. Um, you are so much better pr uh, protected by having it. <laughs> you would rather take the risk of not getting the release than not having a release um, in my legal opinion. Could not agree more. I remember when I first started at Getty Images and we had a photo studio in-house, I was the person that would hold up the sign and hand it to the models during the casting that said, you could be on a tampon box. You could be the one in 10 people with your face circle that has IBS. Just, you know, like, no, you know, this this is possible. Could also be on a vacuum cleaner box. Right. You know, it's all it's all over the place. Okay, let's take a look at definitions. Just, you know, this is an important part of any type of, of release or other type of contract. I know technically model releases, Nancy, aren't contracts per se. Oh, some um, are. Releases, some, some can be a contract. Yep. <laughs> this, is, this is important if you, if you have very specific terms. Nancy and I know from considerable personal experience that uh, it is important to have definitions there and to be able to rely on those definitions later in case there is some confusion and some expectations. Also, don't forget to sign your own releases, photographers. I'm looking at you. Um, it, it's really helpful. All this context here about like when you shot something, what was the context of it? Where were you in the world? What date did you, you know, shoot the stuff? All of that helpful in the event of questions later. And don't forget, attach visual reference of model, model here. And we'll get into why that's so yes. important yeah. because a person is a visual representation and all this language with name and all that isn't really helpful if you can't connect the release to the picture. Agree. Yes. Look at all this rich, robust metadata we're trying to collect here. Um, some of it is so that obviously we have all this information and as needed, we can you know, defend claims that, that might come up. But more importantly, we really wanna know authentically, authentically photographers, I'm looking at you again, don't keyword spam and say people are 25 ethnicities. Photographers do it all the time. Customers don't like it or appreciate it. They wanna know in reality, someone's actual self-identity for gender and ethnicity when um, models choose to disclose that. So don't screw Not them up. what they can pass for. Yes. And in the old days, when we had physical catalogs, maybe that was a great idea back then. No, customers don't like it. Don't do it. And um, also, this is the signature, people. You you want to make sure that a mod, the model, that the model signs it. We're going to talk a little bit about um, some of those horror stories in a second. Correct. <laughs> yes. One thing uh, I would ask everyone, um, again, things that have been, I've dealt with internationally mostly, and recently it started cropping up more and more in California, is when someone signs a release and they only have one name, like they don't have a last name, but they only have a first name. Um, are there any specific precautions that you should take? Um, is there an additional step that maybe you should do um, to save yourself 
from liability or from it like later ch being challenged, uh, what would you do? In my experience, we definitely have had talent that have signed releases that, that only go by one name. And if that is how they identify and that's what they write down for themselves, we would expect them to sort of stand behind that if they made any type of an issue later. I don't know, Margaret or Nancy, if you've encountered that specifically where someone... Um, I'm, I'm laughing right now because I just had a client come up to my office and my building would not let her up because she uses only one name, but her driver's license has a first name on it. And because we didn't give that name to my, my building, they wouldn't let her in. <laughs> um, but I would say if someone has a driver's license, take a picture of that uh, as well. So uh, you know that, and I know Margaret had it when we were talking earlier, that if someone you know, doesn't have all the information about a phone or where they live to have them take a picture of them holding up their signed release. What you want, I mean, if you, you know, if an X is your signature and X is your signature, if you literally, if you legally go by one name, I mean, that's good enough for consent. We're looking for consent and what is legal consent. What you don't want is someone to give you a fake name which we have had. And what you don't want is to have a really efficient um, assistant who helps you out by signing all the releases for you before, <laughs> to, just in case a model might forget, you want the model to sign the release. We don't want your assistant signing any releases. Um, it, it's really not helpful. The place that I um, that I think is is currently the most challenging around names on releases is um, for non-binary and transgender folks, and so there, especially I, I find I have found this particularly in in making contracts with um, folks who who are transgender and have a legal name that is not their name they use and that they don't live by and so sometimes it's a matter of of having a conversation and, and seeing what they're comfortable with um what the legal name you know is there a legal name do you do you just do us both um but i try to always just work with the model and what they're what they're comfortable with and what we can um allow for like nancy said it's about the consent um right. more than the name also just a shout out for date of birth Sometimes people feel like this is a lot of personal information about myself. Do you even want my date of birth? We do. Now, if they won't give you the month and the day, I mean, I, I wish that they would. It, you have no idea how important it, it is oftentimes to know exactly the age of somebody at the time of the shoot, the shoot date, critical, need to know what day you shot it. Also need to know um, how old was this model at the time that you created this photo or this video clip? Because our friends who are in different industries like alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical, often have regulatory within their trade organization rules about marketing and that a, a model has to be a certain age uh, in order to be used in marketing. So we get those questions all the time. And if that information isn't as helpful as it could be, you are losing out on a license. Yeah, Just I think the, the FTC actually has regulations that you really can't shoot people like smoking that look like they could be too young. And so ad agencies often may want to know that someone's like over 25 or something. And if you don't have that information, you make the images less valuable. Yep. I'm going to keep us moving. We didn't talk, when are we talking about children though? Cause we had a space there. Is this now or later? We're, we can talk about, we can, we can talk about it. We've got, we've got a spot for it. In yeah, fact, right, right here, safety first. Put your harnesses on, wear a helmet. I mean, secure your, your storage. That's right. Secure storage. I Everybody should know data privacy breaches are, you read about them in the headlines all the time. Don't be the person that leaves your model releases unattended. Don't do it. Make sure that they're, you know, securely stored away and that when you're making them available to different marketplaces that require them like me make sure that those marketplaces are extremely reliable and have robust security measures in place so that there isn't a, a data breach but just what, an ounce of precaution heather what happens if a client wants to know that there is a release and it's signed what do you well, show them I love this question because it happens all the time and our, uh, our our sales operations team fields a lot of these types of requests. 
our policy is we would make a model release available to a client fully redacted with all of their personally identifiable information like their physical street address, their name, their printed name. We would offer their date of birth because that's an important factor. A lot of places are looking to validate that a model really is the age yeah. that we say that they are. Um, we'd also leave in information about what city, state, country, and also the ethnicity and how they identify gender wise. We would leave that available in case that was uh, an important factor. Some Sometimes just a, a brand doing a really big campaign, it is so important to them or their legal department or business affairs department to know for sure that mm -hmm. this is what we say that it is because you get punked um, often in social media when you don't get it right. So those redacted releases are made available. And then sometimes there are instances where our customers are under the auspices of the Screen Actors Guild. And <laughs> in their in their experience, they may have to, uh, you know, see a very clean copy of a release with a model's contact information because they look in the site database for payment right so in that in that case there is a very stern i think nancy helped me write it letter that we send to those customers who are requesting those releases we know who those agencies are and have a, a level of professional you know trust that they are not going to disclose these releases or use these releases for any other purpose other than their um, obligation under the SAG contract. So those are instances where they're made available or litigation. But again, that would be um, you know protected information where we would have a protective order in place and not be just willy-nilly uh, giving up a model's information. Sometimes people stalk our models and our photographers yeah. wanting information. <clears throat> We get, I mean, we, and I'm sure you do too, questions about, can you give me this model's information? And like, they're going to call them up and ask them out. And yeah, no. Right. Not okay. <laughs> Not okay. Yeah. So we want it legible. Keep good records about your photo shoots. Also. And remember your licenses are perpetual, which means forever. So do not ever get rid of them. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Hold Don't put them in a basement if they're paper where that could be flooded because that happens. That's happened. Of mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that has happened. Yeah. And That's if you store something in a hard drive, remember redundancy. I mean, the cloud is much better now, but there were times before that where there would um, be crashes. The other thing I don't know if we mentioned that if for a, a release to be valid, you have to be of legal age to sign it. So when you're taking pictures of anyone under, you know, 18, you need to have a legal guardian and you need to make sure they're actually their legal guardian and not just saying they are. You're um, right, Nancy, I'm going back to the last slide. There yeah, is a section that's right like, there if it's a monitor. Zing, zing, a zing, zing. Do not forget yeah. that. Um, yeah. Because and, yeah. you could have, um, someone can uh, decide that they will just revoke their permission then. Right. People do try to invalidate their releases because they are not completely filled out. That comes up a lot. Okay, another thing, check for carve outs. Sometimes you think you have sent out this really great, awesome, broad release because you really wanna use this content in a stock marketplace and you wanna make sure it is like as broad as possible. And then you get it back and maybe the model has like, hmm, crossed out this line in the consent section and then added in, I don't want this used for anything political or banking or alcohol or tobacco. Once upon a time, there were we had a lot of releases that were like that. And depending on what marketplace you're working with, that may or may not work. There may or may not be able to be those restrictions instituted. For regular creative royalty-free stock content that's being made available to customers very for broad you know commercial grant of rights those types of carve outs do not work in this space don't be the taster's choice people i'm not trying to call out that brand but a little bit i am who got a really bad 16 million dollar hit when they used a very limited very specific for one purpose type of model release and then forgot how limited it was and then went into a full on production with their product packaging only to get hit with under California law percentage of the profits attributable to their product had to go to that model. That was bad. Now that was years ago. 
I haven't heard about a decision like that um, in a really long time. I think I think the industry very much stood up and took notice. Do we have any really limited releases? Let's be really careful about how we license it. Say is I think you know those if if I get a release that has those sorts of limits or exclusions, I can't accept it. Same. Because we yep. can't control that. We can't, we can't, you've made a promise to your model, but right. we can't enforce that. So, right. yeah. Now um, those releases might work if you're an individual photographer or agency and you're doing a super specific paid assignment for a brand and that model release is very specifically for that brand's ad campaign. Great. You need to like keep that separate from the general population of releases that you're using for stock. It's great. You still need to keep that release, but just don't try to make that content available in the stock space. Okay, safety Let's first. Let's talk about recognizability. So this is what Arohi was getting at earlier. What makes something recognizable? Who wants to talk about that one? Um, I mean, I can give you the sort of the, the high level and then I'm sure Nancy will have some yeah. additional specifics. Um, you know, you need to watch for um, elements of, even if the you can't see a face, there are certainly elements that make people recognizable. Uh, tattoos are an excellent example. <laughs> you might have an image that is just a hand, but if there's a tattoo on that, you know, it's, it's the person can recognize. Uh, that's, that's, you know, and then there's sort of a continuum in that respect as well. A very basic standard tattoo might not create the same recognizability, something really unique um, would make it very, very recognizable. Um, clothing, unique clothing sometimes has that element. Uh, the context and location of, of um, where you've, you've created the work. Um, I'm trying not to use the word shoot and it sometimes results in weird sentences. <laughs> um, but yeah, so all of those context elements, um, yeah. And and different states have different standards. So for example, California is like, you have to be sort of generally recognizable. And what makes someone recognizable, as Margaret said, can be something that's part of your persona. So if you were a modern modern day Charlie Chaplin and you always wore the same hat and had a little cane, even your silhouette might be recognizable. Um, and uh, in New York, you can be recognizable if the per the model only if the model even knows. There was once years ago uh, an herbal essence case where there was um, the backside of a woman with her child in some river, and she could recognize some dimples. So that was that. <laughs> you have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, and I did have a claim once where someone's head couldn't be seen, but it was this really unique painted guitar. And, and I think it might've been from New Orleans or something. And everyone knew who that person was because that was the guitar that was connected to that person. So if a piece of an identity can connect you to the uh, your real identity, a piece right. of your persona or something about you or your, you know, your silhouette that was so obvious. This Fancy. is why my yes. favorite anonymous shots are people in snow gear from the back. <laughs> yes, totally with you. That's good. All good. <laughs> here's an exception that about the recognizability factor. And Nancy covered this so well in our copyright webinar that we did last September. Just remember about astronauts. There might be some oh. photo, photo archive folks here where you've got some NASA content that you, uh, oh. you know, make available for licensing. Customers forget that the iconic shots of astronauts on the moon just because NASA took it and the NASA photo is public domain. It doesn't mean the people who worked for NASA have given up on their rights of publicity, even postmortem rights for some of our beloved astronauts who have passed on. So just because you can't see their face, they recognize themselves because those moments are so spectacularly unique. And if you uh, ever have a customer who wants to make a commercial use of one of those very famous people, uh, you know, phone a friend and get your rights and clearance team involved. Because Nancy and I can tell you, you don't want to litigate with Buzz or Colonel Irwin's widow. You just, you know, don't, you don't need to do it. Don't do it. Right? Right. Right. Yes. Yes. It's called the visor shot where yeah. you can see the reflection of Neil Armstrong in Buzz Aldrin's helmet. Yeah. And 
the idea is that that stance and that image is so recognizable that you know who it is yeah. because how many astronauts were the first ones to step on the moon. Right. So those are the kind of things that um, you can't make assumptions. In, in I can I can also tell you, though, from personal experience, those same astronauts and their estates would love to hear from you for commercial licensing opportunities. I mean, so they're into it. They just want to get paid for commercial use. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. let's move on. What about crowd shots? I have a couple different crowd shots here. Mm -hmm. um, naturally occurring crowd shots, Nancy, like the photo on the left in Times yeah. Square. I, I think that's uh, pretty great for I commercial use, not I one particular person. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine because no, not one person is standing out. And when we get to the another series, we talk yeah. about, you know, trademarks. Yeah, it is. It isn't as if any one person would be um, associated with your product or ser services. And it's very hard to really distinguish one person from another. Right. Uh, what you wouldn't want to do is have a client like zoom into a particular face. Yeah, yeah. like the photo on the right, like the, the, on the, right. the gentleman yeah. who is standing still in the midst of the chaos, holding his mobile phone. I don't recommend that, by the way. That looks very unsafe to me. Um, he yeah. has signed a model release. So I, he's I, good, I he is good to go. Very glad that he did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's get on to um, burning hot topics about claims and dispute resolution um this is, this is a very area. this, this is, is a very area. rich very rich area i have promoted myself from being claims and litigation at getty images to being um much more of an ip uh, influencer with customers and like taking some lessons that we have learned from claims and litigation and like things that you maybe should avoid to have a much better outcome and a much more successful campaign. So I'm into that, but I, I definitely have the benefit of experience. And I know some people from our claims team, um, our global claims team are, are probably watching right now and prepared to blush. I'm gonna talk about you. Um, but the most important thing for the, for the agency and photographer community to remember is that claims happen, it just it is what it is. And you need to take a deep breath, count to 10, some photographers and agencies get so mad and so offended that someone is questioning their integrity, that they didn't do something right, that they didn't get permission when they know that they did. You just have to be calm, be professional. I would not say that I am that professional, but I am calming. I can be calming. You need to listen, listen for understanding. Um, I used to teach preschool before I worked at Getty Images when I was in college. And I like to say that teaching preschool prepared me very well for dispute resolution because you have a lot of people with a lot of feelings and they don't always have words to go with those feelings. And so it's a little bit of like, what do you do with the mad that they feel? And you sort of work that story problem. Um, also, sometimes people are really losing their mind about something, and then you need to know when to phone a friend. If people are actively threatening litigation, uh, maybe you need to call an outside professional for some help. Maybe you need to contact the marketplace where you have your content. You might wanna call Margaret or me or the claims team here and let us know, hey, I'm having a lot of trouble with this model, I've done all of the things of like talking them through what they signed. I've got all of my documentation in place about how I ran this photo shoot and how I have informed consent. And they are just, wow, I, you know, I need some help. I mean, we have, we have resources and we can tell you some things, but we can also refer you to amazing outside counsel like these lawyers on this call. It's really good. Um, also, if you have uh, errors and omissions insurance, I know it's really expensive, but it is it's very helpful. It. it is, it can be. Worth it the second worth. You need it. <laughs> yeah. So if you do have a claim that kind of like would be something that comes up under that particular policy, know your policy, know your broker, and know when you need to make a claim against that particular policy. Preserve all of that so that you're not told later, oh, sorry, we can't cover that. It wasn't timely notice. Sucks. Don't do it. Um, settlements. Sometimes you're going to need to do a settlement with a model. Sometimes that settlement includes a brand new model release where it is a situation of informed consent. 
Sometimes you have to write checks. Sometimes they want really unusual things. I have had people say, well, if you send me this exotic fruit from Washington State all the way to the UK, I won't be mad at you anymore and I'll, it'll make this go away. I'm not saying that that's normal. That is definitely an exception to the rule, but it has happened. Um, I don't know, Margaret, do you wanna get in there and say anything about, <laughs> about settlements or advice about uh, the, the tantrums? Definitely. Uh, I think to take a deep breath is very important. It's really easy in those moments to panic and uh, especially the first few times. <laughs> um, we're here to tell you that they are resolvable. Um, the first thing I do, you know, Heather's example is great in that, she, you know, you had someone come to you and said they'd done all these things. The first thing I always do um, with with unhappy models and and the contributors that have the releases or not as the case may be is i encourage them to talk i remind them that this you know it's a contract or a non-contract between the um, artist and the model the agency is not a party to that um, please go and have a conversation and see if you can work this out um, that's always my first step i i should say not always that is generally my first step in case unless there's a situation um, otherwise, I have had a couple of situations where um, there were photographs of uh, a past, um, you know, girlfriend and there was some, uh, you know, personal um, abuse concerns and issues. That's one where I don't, where I wouldn't say go talk to them. That's one where we can help, but definitely that, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> Oh, you I know, will... one more thought while we have these lawyers with us, yeah. Margaret, is that yeah. if you if, if litigation is threatened against you, sometimes that's a very vague threat. I'm going to sue you if I had a dollar for every time someone said that to me. Wow. Yeah. The vacations yeah. I could have. But um, don't don't like throw your documents away because you think something. Oh, maybe I did screw this up. I'm just going to get rid of my stuff. Never do that. You. I'll tell you, I the the story that I've told this group so many times as we've prepared for this is um, we did have a, a 16 year old who signed her mother's name on her release, um, which was a disaster. Um, and I got the angry parent calls and we calmed everything down and I thought we were good. And then two years later, right before the statute of limitations ran out, there came the claim. I, I mean, it, it was literally not something I'd thought about in years. So yeah. Um, Definitely hold on to it. Yeah. Keep your records. Yeah. Do we have okay. time for the next slide? Yeah. Okay. Mistaken identity, my favorite topic. My claims oh, team is like getting oh, lit up from within. <laughs> when you care enough to send the very best, if you send a certain kind of greeting card, it's going to get the most visceral reactions because people think they recognize themselves, their mom, their kids, their pets. We've heard it all. And in this instance, the photo on the far left of this absolutely glamorous goddess was used in a greeting card. A family in the States, Pennsylvania, saw it, lost their mind, thought this was their mom, thought this was their mom who lives in an assisted living facility and has dementia. No way would this assisted living facility just let a random photographer go in there and take a photo, let alone a greeting card company. It happens on. way more than you think. It happens all the time. And so one of the best things that we can do is uh, listen and under we understand, okay, okay, we need to, uh, it, this is going to be a case of mistaken identity for sure. But we don't be too smug and be a jerk. Like, be, just listen for understanding, be calm. And then because we have the model release, yes, we want that model release. And because we have all the information about the shoot and maybe some of the similar images, sister images that came in with it, we can pivot. Ross from Friends, you're welcome, Friends. We're referencing you today, um, <laughs> and we well, show. I know, right? And we and we show additional images of the same model, and the family was like, "This is hilarious." This one photo where she's all tarted up with the Elvis glasses looks just like our mom. Obviously, this lady is not our mom. This woman is a DJ in the UK. She is a very big deal, but definitely not their mother. And so then they calm down. But then you know what they said? We're going to tell everybody that this is our mom and we're going to buy out this greeting card in the tri-state area. So awesome. you're welcome, customer. I sold out your card in three states because of the way that we handled the claim. Similarly, 
Some of you may remember this story from a few years ago where uh, this made headlines. One of our iStock photos went viral because a gentleman saw a use of, of this photo in an article by MIT Tech Review and said, that's me, I'm the guy. You can't use a photo of me. It's disparaging to refer to me as a hipster. I'm going to sue you, you don't have my permission. So the publisher was like, but wait a minute, this is an editorial type of view, so I don't think we need your permission anyway. And didn't we get this from iStock? And isn't this iStock's problem? And then uh, we were like, yes, please make it our problem. So Veronica from our claims team based in Calgary uh, talked to the gentleman who thought for sure that he was the guy. And she explained, I know you think you're the guy because you really look like the guy in this photo, but let me show you the hundred other images in different wardrobes and looking directly at the camera, I, I, I think it's not you because your names don't match what we have on the model release. That's why that model release is so that's, important. That's I'm interrupting you again. We said we'd do this. Do um, <laughs> Arohi has some questions though. Yeah. I just wanted out. to add the, the very first thing when you get these mis mistaken identity pieces, the very first thing I always do is ask the complainer for their name. Yes. You don't have it. Like a lot of times I'll get, you know, my girlfriend, this, whatever, get the name of the person that they claim is in the picture. And then you can compare that to the release. And that's going to be your first good step. You're so right. Okay. I could riff on mistaken identity I all know, day. All day. I, I just realized <laughs> the time, Nancy, I'm sorry. So I, okay. So regretful models, models who lie, about, I never signed it, but they did. They forgot, that happens all the time. And then the forgeries, we hit on that a little bit. That's why these releases are so important. Sensitive, I'm just gonna blow through this, sensitive uses. Sometimes, you know, uh, our customers want to do something that would potentially give rise to a defamation claim um, from a model. So that is something very specifically when you're in your licensing mode, working directly with customers. Hopefully they're being very specific, specific about what they're doing. Hopefully your end user license agreement is really clear about what they are allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do. And sometimes we actually have to contact models working directly with photographers and we see if they wanna sign a supplemental release very specifically for a brand customer. That's a win-win for the model. They might get an extra buck and the photographer gets the copyright license. That's how Yay. we handle sensitive use for clients as well, yeah. Just some quickie best practices. Just, I'm not even gonna read them. I'm just gonna show them to you. This is gonna be recorded. You could look at it later. Ready? Everybody read it? Okay, getting on to the question section. <laughs> Oh, I know we're over time. Can people stay for a few more minutes? Is that okay? We can stay, right? If if you can stay, I would say continue and because right. this will be recorded. We have lost some people already, but let's keep going if you all can. Absolutely. Great. So I'm going to, um, Rick Bray had two very interesting questions and I'm going to ask um, the last question we asked first, which is, in a recent shoot in Ukraine, I filmed a number of people on the front lines of a battle who completely uh, who completely consented to being filmed. Yet there was no f practical way to hand out releases for signatures. Instead, I simply filmed their consent on camera prior to filming the rest of the scenes. Under the circumstances, is this acceptable? Um, what state was that? In the Ukraine. Ukraine. In oh. U Ukraine, not the Ukraine. It's Ukraine. Ukraine. Okay. Say it right. I don't know Ukraine law. Um, in a lot of states in the US, if you have the verbal consent recorded, it would be fine. New York is one state that says a writing, but I think in those circumstances, you do the best you can do to show you have consent. Um, and, and you know, I, you'd know, i have to defer to someone who was familiar with the, the law in Ukraine, but it, it seems like you were, at least showing that the person knew what it was and, and make sure they just understand what they're doing. Yep, never hurts. Always better to have it in writing as well, but yeah, it's at least getting at the at the core values of, the, of what we're trying to do. Um, okay, the next question is, um, in spite of your First Amendment right to parody, um, do you still face defamation action for creating it? For creating the content of the uh, people. Creating the content? No, so. it would be a, that's that's a the creation of it is is an, an expressive work, so that would be covered by the First Amendment as well. How customers use it 
or how it's licensed for end uses could give rise right. to something like that. We certainly have experience right. um, so claims that way. You could create the parody shop, but if someone used it in a commercial way or in a way that was not parody, but was defamatory, that would be different. Fun um, yeah, one question that I think uh, is important for most artists uh, artists to know is when someone does come and challenge their use uh, of their image or personality by a photographer or videographer or basically any digital business, uh, what are some in initial steps they should take? Um, obviously, they often do go to lawyers, but before that, there are a lot of steps that they end up doing and there are a lot of interactions they have. So what are some of the first things that you think that they should be doing? Grab your shoot records, hold on to your amount of releases. That's where I would start. And it maybe interview some people who were at the shoot with you. Maybe you um, hired some folks to help you with wardrobe that day or styling or your photo assistant. In, in effect, um, Heather, we had a, a success years ago, remember, when someone videoed the shoot and we yeah. could show when the when some guy thought it was him but it really was another man and his wife and they were like kissing in the ocean and this guy yeah. was insisting it yeah. was him. But we had a video that showed the shoot so we could tell precisely that this was not a mistaken identity. Yeah. It, it was just only mistaken identity. Yeah. So, I know memory is expensive sometimes with storage, but keeping your outtakes can really help um, defend a claim. It's not why I, I guess you don't want to prepare for that specifically, but I'm just telling you it's useful. Also, customers, by the way, sh shout out for outtakes. Customers sometimes ask us, hey, do you have any more images from the shoot? I would love to see more. And then that's great because then we'll call you and ask you for more. And maybe you'll have your, your raw files. <laughs> that's right. We'd run into that too. Um, and I think the last question that I'll ask, and it's sort of it's into um, Rick's initial question and what we've been talking about is when media is being produced and it's created solely for circulation in the United States. Um, however, the shots have been taken in different jurisdictions, um, maybe some in France or, or in India or in this case, the Ukraine, um, which jurisdiction governs the rights and releases? Nancy, you want to grab that one? Ah. Because personality is where the person has the most contacts. In general, that should be the law because that's where the person has, you know, their community where they could, you know, have an effect. There are some weird state right of publicity laws. I don't know how Washington State for one that says things like, oh well, uh, there's no, you know. Our, our our act has no um, applies to any jurisdiction or something or doesn't conflicts of law don't apply, but generally it's a place where the person has the most context. So that would likely be where you shoot it. So um, there's some oddball laws out there, but yeah. And and my absolute last question, okay, definitely is um, what are some common challenges that you think um, and that you've seen that photographers um, and other media companies have when trying to obtain a release and any suggestions on how to combat those? We've talked about some of them. Um, for me, I, I always think about the, the point I mentioned earlier about fear about getting a no. Um, you know, I think that's that's a piece, you know, um you know trying to run an entire you know production alone right if you don't have that support from other folks that's that's going to be that's going to help make things a challenge um, budget certainly a case um not having your uh, i'm stealing uh heather's note here on like not having your elevator pitch on what stock is ready um that's easy to work on Everybody can work on that. I, I I worked here for a really long time. I still work on it, but that's that's something you can, I mean, I'll hang out with you. Call me, we'll, we'll rehearse. It's really about talking to your models. It yeah. really is. It really does come down to that informed consent piece. Having those conversations with models, making sure they understand. That's, you know, it, it can be a difficult conversation to start if, especially as you're learning how to do it, but it really is worth the practice and doing it regularly because that will yeah. be the biggest protection you have. And, and no means no. So if you've already taken the photo, 
and you're in love with it, and then they say, no, I don't consent to that. Don't, don't forge it. the release. Don't use it. Don't make something up. No means no. It's universal. Don't try to make, don't try to make it anonymous. Yes. <laughs> and it's helpful to show the uh, online uh, terms and conditions of use that say that it can't be used for defamatory use. It can't be used for right. pornographic use. Agreed. And that if anything could be unflattering, there needs to be a disclaimer. Right. So I think that's helpful. And I always try to get the release signed first. I mean, don't don't spend yeah, all the money in the photo shoot and then have the release signed. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Stock <laughs> is not for everybody. It is not. issue than you'd think. And it is. Yeah. And, and I, I know really uh, I think there was some property release questions, but we're doing an entire webinar on that. So if anyone didn't get all their questions answered, there's more to come. And if you have specific questions you want to seed into the next series, yeah, this is people. We're next time we're doing places and then we're doing things. It's going to be great. <laughs> we'll see you next well, time. This was great. Uh, this was great. And thank you again, um, everyone who's joined us to on the panel. Um, thank you all and all of the participants and everyone who is here um, listening to us. Thank you again. It was, it was great having you and hope to see you in the other series. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.